What's happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Crossed Up. Anthony Sanfilippo is here. I'm Bob Wankel. And Anthony, we finally get to talk about the Phillies coming off of a series victory. It was not a good road trip for the Phillies against the Braves, the Mets, and the Nationals. But the way things started down in D.C. on Friday night, this thing could have gone completely, completely off the rails. So credit to the Phillies for bouncing back getting the final two games against the Nationals team that they have simply dominated now, really for the last two years or so at this point. I believe I heard yesterday after the game they are now 26-4 and four against Washington in their last 30 games. So they do escape down there with the series win. Is all well in Phillies land now. Here comes the march to 500 or just a temporary stop of, or a temporary reprieval, so almost, so to speak, for what has otherwise been just pure misery. Yeah, that's a great question, Bob, and I'm not sure we have an answer yet, right? I mean, this has been the most team that that, that that hits the extremes so easily, and there's no middle ground, right? So you know, you don't have that – those middle games are really kind of evaluate. They are either really frigging good or they're really frigging bad, and there's like – there's that no middle, right? Um, you, you'd like to hope that there's some good signs on the offensive end of things – I mean, we'll talk about individuals today um, that really had a nice weekend. Uh, came out of uh, looked like they were starting to come out of some slumps. Um, Nick Castellanos is on freaking fire again, um, which is something that we keep saying at, at periods of time during the during the season. And there's something I want to touch on with him uh, when we get a minute. Um, so I really don't have an answer for you. I, you know, it is the Nationals, after all. I mean, it's a better Nationals team. If you watch these games, you see that they actually have some players. These guys are decent hitters, right? And they got a decent little lineup. They got, them, you know, some of their starting pitching is okay. Their bullpen leaves a little bit to be desired. But, I mean, it's not it's not as bad a Nationals team. How, do, how does like a major league team not employ a left-handed reliever? Which I'm sure a lot of Nationals fans were saying to themselves as Kyle Schorber yeah. It's his, you know, second three run homer of the game or whatever. Was it the first one? I mean, you just, you, you sit there and you look at it. You're like, what, what is this? How does this yeah. happen? You know? So. Yeah. I mean, so there, there are, there are still major deficiencies there. Um, but you know, you look ahead and you see that they're playing Detroit next. And again, Detroit's another bad team who's played better, you know, than, than expected. But this is one of those series coming up where you sit there and say, well, they're not playing the nationals 19 times. But you're looking for a series that's kind of replacing three of those six games that you lost against the Nationals. Well, this is it coming up against Detroit. You know, you're going to have Kansas City and Oakland later in the year. So you're, you're going to make up those games that that you lost playing Washington. Um, so, yeah, this this could be the time where it turns around. But, Bob, I, you, you just can't make a solid prediction with this team about anything at, at this point. I think we still need to see it a little bit more. And when I say a little bit more, I don't even mean this series and say, oh, well, okay, let's say they win. They, let's say we would sweep the Tigers. We're just going to sit here and say after five, you know, a five game win streak, oh, okay, all's right with the world because we've seen that happen and then we've seen them lose five in a row. So I, I can't say anything until about another two weeks. I think, I think we're going to need at least before we determine if this team's trending in the right direction. No, I think you're absolutely right. You watch the series play out and you say, okay, you applaud the fact that they lose the opener and they're still able to escape with a series victory. That's a step in the right direction that I'm, I'm, you cannot come on here and complain that they failed to sweep Washington. Um, I think that, that there was one thing to really be concerned about on Friday night and Zach Wheeler, but there were some positives. The fact that they had been playing so poorly, they dig themselves such a big hole early on and they chip away, chip away, chip away, and then they get things evened up. And then the bullpen and Connor Brogdon lets them down on Friday night. But you, at least you saw a little bit of, I'm not going to use the R word here, but you saw some fight. You, you saw them not just simply roll over. And then it kind of, I think, translated from a momentum standpoint a little bit into the remainder of that series. Because when you look at what they were countering with from a pitching perspective, you're talking about a bullpen game on Saturday. And Andrew Suarez, I know, had a decent start against the Mets, but you're not at a point yet where you really felt good about what he was bringing every time through the rotation. So this thing could have gotten really ugly. Um, and so I will give them credit for at least stopping it here. But in terms of is this a, a positive signal? How much can you take away from the fact that they scored 22 runs in three games against the Nationals with this lineup reconfiguration? I credit Rob Thompson for finally getting Trey Turner out of the friggin' two-hole. Like, great job there. That's a step in the right direction as far as I'm concerned. 
does Kyle Schwarber back in the leadoff spot? He goes five for 15 in the three games in the leadoff spot. He was on base six out of 16 times. A couple home runs yesterday. Like, is there something to be said for this new dynamic that might be able to sustain a little bit of offensive thump for them? Like, these are the questions I think you have to really look at. But as far as are the Phillies back, is this going to be the, the start of a run? I'm not even close to that. I can't even I can't even honestly entertain that with a straight face right now because it's so early. Yeah, it is so early. And, and the other thing is, Bobby, again, you give him credit for doing the things he had to do to to tinker with the lineup and change it up because obviously what was there was not working. But it's again, you pointed out, you know, the Nationals don't have a left-handed reliever, so you could stack lefties stack your line against up. them, right? And it wouldn't and have it not hurt you. Um, so the question now becomes, as you go forward into the next series against Detroit and then so forth and so on, can you still do this kind of lineup configuration against these other teams? And the answer to that is no, because they're all going to have lefties that they can throw at you. So what do you do? Because right now the Phillies don't have a, a two-hitter. I mean, okay, we're going to go back to Schwarber in this one spot. Okay, or do they not? <laughs> or do they not? <laughs> do they not have Drew Ellis? <laughs> 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 I actually want to – we, we, should, we should talk but about him. But... You want to you you dive, dive into Superman? Yeah, Let's dive into Superman. yeah. I, I hear your point. And listen, they're going to see a left-handed pitcher, not a very good one tonight, in uh, Joey Wentz uh, for yeah. the Tigers. But – you know, the, the, you're right. There, you not only do you worry about the fact that <laughs> their future opponents will <laughs> have left-handed relievers. I will say though, when you talk about this, when you're facing when you're facing a team that's throwing a righty pitcher at this point, I almost wonder if the Phillies get to a, a, a situation where they say, "Forget it. Like, let's not worry about late game matchups. Let's just see if we can bash you over the head in the first five innings and build the lead, and then worry about it later down the line." Because they're so poor in terms of that mixed match right now, and they're so one-sided that I almost feel like you just embrace it and say, let's stack it and see if we can get those leads that they haven't been able to establish in late innings like we talked about last week. You are saying just the, the sheer volume or lack of volume of games that they've led by three runs or less going into the seventh inning that this bullpen's had to protect this season. It's because they don't get leads, really. They don't get a lot of leads. So it's almost like maybe we just go for broke and sell out in the beginning of the game and then worry about our fate later. Um, there may be something to that, but yeah, like, let's just take a temporary detour here and talk about Mr. Ellis, um, you know, three for three, uh, on, in the finale against the nationals, uh, gets on base all five times. And it was Corey Simon who had an interesting note, uh, in his game story. Uh, he became the first Philadelphia Philly since Ryan Howard in July of 2007 to go three for three or better with multiple home runs and walks in a single game. So we saw an offensive performance yesterday uh, by a Philadelphia Philly that we had not seen in the previous 16 years. It was really impressive. My question to you would be, one, has he bought himself some more run here? And two, I know that that is not what he is uh, and it would be completely unreasonable to expect anything close to that. But has he not only just bought himself a little bit more run, like in terms of when Alec Bohm gets back, he's gone, but potentially finds his way into the mix here moving forward? I, he, he may not be gone um, when Alec Bone gets back because, I, I don't know, do you, do, do you sit there and I, – I, look, I, I, just think, I just think that they, you need right, a right – they need right-handed hitters, just people who can hit that are right-handed. I mean, let's be honest, Okay. Josh Harrison has not been great. He had a good game Saturday, right? When I when I, I went on Twitter and killed the Phillies for starting three bench players on Saturday, and of course Josh Harrison goes out and gets two hits, right? And those and, and really makes me look bad. <laughs> uh, you know, in your defense, it had been a month, so yeah, I mean. yeah. But um, uh, you know, and then you had you, 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 peak, you, What is he giving you, other than a little bit of versatility to play? Three positions, four positions. I mean, in an emergency, he can play shortstop, um, and and a veteran presence in the clubhouse. That would be better for your team than what potentially Drew Ellis could give you. And I'm not saying that because Drew Ellis had one good weekend. Also, we should start thinking Drew Ellis is bet as a better option than Josh Harrison. 
But isn't it worth considering that because Harrison, what's what's the what's the pinnacle for Harrison? What's the top that Harrison can do for you versus what's the ceiling for an Ellis? And, uh, me, and Ellis think, is also a younger player. And yeah. I mean, that's a consideration as well by quite a substantial yeah. margin. And, and so, so, so to me, I think that that could be the difference. I think Drew Ellis could displace Josh Harrison on this roster um, once Alec Bohm gets back. So do you, how do you treat that then? Are you in evaluation mode if you're the Phillies right now? Is it just, hey, Drew Ellis, show us what you can do? Or are you also – simultaneously giving Josh Harrison the opportunity to show maybe he was able to build on what we saw on Saturday. Like, are, are we opening this back up to late March now? And this is the final stretch run. Hey guys, show us what you got. Or do they maybe already have that decision in mind and, and kind of know what they're going to do here? I, I think, I think that they're probably 90% sure what they want to do. You know what I'm saying? Um, but that they, they could let this play out. They do have a little bit more time. Um, I, it does sound like Bohm's not going to be right back on day 10, right? They're mm -hmm. probably going to let it go a little bit longer than that. So Harrison's going to have some time. I wouldn't be surprised. Again, we, you know, we don't know what the lineups are going to be, but I wouldn't be surprised if Harrison maybe gets a start tonight. Uh, it's against the Tigers where he was last year um, against the lefty who's not a good lefty. So I would see I could see Harrison getting a start at third base, for example, uh, and and play um, uh, Ellis at first tonight. So they both in the lineup. So kind of like an in-game competition in a sense and, and see how this plays out over the course of the next week to 10 days and then finally make a decision. I, but I do believe that barring other injuries or barring other situations that crop up, that if everybody's healthy and Bohm is back, and Ellis keeps doing what he's doing. Again, he can't be, he can't fall off the table and be nothing. Then I think maybe he might have more value than Harrison going forward. Is it interesting that he played yesterday over at Mundo Sosa? Well, yeah. I mean, I, so Sosa's, in, and I was going to bring him up too as a possibility, but I, I just think that Sosa's got even more versatility than Harrison. Like if you're comparing those two, I think that, again, there's more upside with Sosa. There's more versatility with Sosa. I think that's a, that's something that you could, if you're weighing what what this team needs to get back into this, I still think Sosa has more value than Harrison. Um, the one thing, Bobby, that might be worth looking, and I didn't look, did you, since you brought it up, it just comes to mind. Does Sosa have an option? I would have to look that up. Um, and I, I would tell you this, though. The reason why I asked that is not to uh, insinuate that I think that they may even – that they would consider that. I, I think he's safe. But what I the reason why I ask and the reason why I mention this is that I believe that the Phillies are learning or have learned here over the last four to six weeks what I've pretty much said at the start, which was my concern with the Mundo Sosa, is the overexposure idea that – you just cannot play him five, six days a week. Right. And I, I think that regardless, like you can, you, he has more upside. I think that the Phillies view him more favorably than, than either Drew Ellis or Josh Harrison. Correct. I don't think that his job's in jeopardy, but I do think that the Phillies have to find ways. And I think this is part of the consideration with a guy like Ellis. The Phillies have to find ways to protect the Mundo Sosa a little bit from this idea of being overexposed. You just, I don't think you can play him as frequently as they have been at different points this season. And I think they have to scale that usage back a little bit in order to get more out of him. I really do feel like that. So um, I think this is an important decision. The Phillies really could use some type of jolt from the right side. We talked about this numerous times throughout the season. And if, if they can even just get, a three-week a three run where come August we say, man, how about those those three weeks that Drew Ellis gave the Phillies in June and then he fell off the cliff? Okay, <laughs> I would almost sign up for that that life jacket right now if he could just stay hot for a month. That would be great, you know? And, and I don't think that the Phillies think that they've solved all their problems from the right side all of a sudden, but I, I think that they will certainly test whether or not there's some sustainability to this, and I'd be stunned if he was not in the lineup tonight. I would be too. I think he's certainly in the lineup tonight. Um, I guess the question is just is who who else is in the lineup with him? You know, 
I, and maybe look here's you know they're not I, can, is, can they possibly take Stott out of the lineup again would he possibly do that again against a a, a terrible lefty like Wentz like, I you, mean, know, really. you know we're setting this up, right? Like, this podcast is going to hit everyone's feeds at 11, 12 o'clock today, and they're going to listen to it before the game. And this is the third time we've now said that Wentz sucks. Well, actually, if you go back to 2019, I've been saying Wentz sucks for about <laughs> <laughs> four years now. But, uh, I mean, we you know, I, I feel like are we, are we setting the Phillies up for failure here tonight or what? <laughs> Well, look, we, we know what their we know what their track record this year has been against left-handed pitching. So it, it, it's quite possible. I mean, when they beat Mackenzie Gore on Saturday, I was like, "Wow, look at that!" Yeah, they actually they actually did okay against a lefty, yeah. um, and it still wasn't great. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, they only what they won four to two, um, and uh, he only got three of the runs, and one of them was the home run by Real Muto. So, I, you know, like, hey, that's uh, yeah, we could be setting them up for for failure, but I, I don't think so. I think that this is a, this is a game they should win, but I just, I'm just curious what the lineup's going to look like, you know, who's going to, who's going to be, I, I just, I don't like taking Bryson Stott out of the lineup. You know, you want to give him a day off here and there. Okay, fine. Cause you got to get the other guys in, but like repeatedly taking him out against lefties. I don't understand it. He, he hits lefties. Well, he, he puts the ball in play. I it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Um, so I actually was – when I was thinking about how I wanted to do or how we wanted to do this show, I was like, I'm going to come out and I'm going to hit Anthony with like three true or false questions. And and I never even got to set it up because that was one of them right there. You know, is this is this a solution? Is this even a, a, a part part of the way to a solution? Um, I, I want to just kind of get right to the point because I think like we'll obviously talk about some different player performance, some of the things that we saw throughout the weekend and try to make sense of it like we always do. But I, I want to get to where this team now stands after this series. Now they come back home and they get a Tigers team that's been, I think, better than people expected and probably better than most casual fans realize. Uh, they have not been particularly good on the road this season. Uh, the Phillies have played better at home. They seemingly have some some momentum for whatever that's worth. You get Aaron Nola tonight. Are the Phillies about to, to kind of like, I don't know. Let me just ask it to you this way. Are the Phillies going to be 500 by the end of the month? But like, let's go through it. You know, we did this before the season. We talked about the month of April where we thought they'd end up. Like, can, I, I have the schedule here. Um you know, they're five under right now. They got three against the Tigers at home. They got three against the Dodgers at home. They got to Arizona for four. They go to Oakland for three. Then they come back home. Braves Mets for three and three. Cubs away. Nationals wrap up the month one game at home. So like, let's perform the exercise here because – I think that that's where a lot of people are starting to wonder. Like we've talked about the slow start last year. We've talked about the slow start this year. Do they have enough to get back on their feet? We know that the national league sucks. The wild card spots are probably going to be pretty wide open here. So we know all the Phillies faults, but my question is, do they get back to 500 by the end of the month? And do they need to, you know, like at what point do you get to July one and say, Hey, they're six under they're four under they're one over. Like what do they need to be in order to kind of, stay in this thing reasonably speaking i i think they're going to be smack on 500 okay I mean, so just as i set up that question you were able to run through it that quickly yeah i looked at Mark it and I, I just saw i mean i, I mean i had i look at the schedule all the time right so you you know that i i kind of ha, you know look ahead to things and see what i it's you know see what's coming and i do think that I, but this is this is indicative on them playing the way that they need to play with, with much more consistency. I, I'm, I'm giving them that benefit of the doubt when I say that I think they can go 14 and nine in the next 23 games. And I think that that's a fair projection. Wait, can you say that one more time? Can you give me that record again? 14 and nine. 14 and nine. Okay. So like just series by series here. So is that two out of three against the Tigers? It is, and it's actually losing two out of three to the Dodgers. Okay, and then they – so they're three and three after the first six. Split in Arizona. So they're going to just your, – your prediction here basically for the next ten games is just more 
take a step forward, take a step back, rip out your hair, spinning your wheels here. Well, that's... I, think it's a, I think it's 500. Look at Dodgers Diamondback, seven games against yeah, those two teams. That's that's tough, man. Yeah. That's tough, especially out in Arizona where they don't win. They just don't yeah. win out there. Um, and again, I do think that, look, if the Phillies lineup is clicking, I think that they can expose some of the weaknesses in Arizona's pitching. Because I do like I like I keep saying I think that Arizona Diamondbacks are two good starters and a bunch of guys, right? I mean that's what I think that they are. Their lineup is very good and very exciting, and I think it's going to be they're going to be a really good team for a good stretch of time with those young kids. But I don't love their pitching, um, so I do think if the Phillies lineup is clicking, maybe you can do a little bit better. But at this point, I, I can't justify saying that they're going to win three of four in Arizona. I don't, I don't. Yeah, I mean, they never play well there. I actually would, yeah. I would take the opposite stance and say yeah. do it, split that series and you're in pretty good shape because they don't play well there. That Arizona team pushed them around at home here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I don't like that matchup at all. That, that's the one that really concerns me. I, I know the Dodgers are very good. We saw what the Mets did to them. Uh, although we got to talk about the Mets in a little bit as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. So go ahead. So then that takes you to the A's series. You, you better sweep the friggin' A's. Okay. I mean, come on. I mean, you, how can you not predict a sweep of the A's? I, I know that they. Tell you, well, hey, listen, Atlanta loses two out of three, but then the, uh, it, you know, the Marlins come in and, 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 you know, you saw that. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I know, that's what I was going to say. I know that they just beat Atlanta, but come on. Like that, that's a, that's a minor league team. You got to, you've got to sweep them. Okay. <laughs> so you then, the sweep. All right. Yeah. Then you have a, then you have a six game stretch with the Braves and Mets again albeit at Citizens Bank Park. You've Look, I, I think we saw that they, can, they showed that they could play with Atlanta. So I'll give the Phillies one game, one advantage. I gave them two out of three in the Atlanta series. Okay. I gave them two out of three. Because, you know, you go down to Atlanta and you, and you split four games with them. And considering one of them was the disaster of you just basically, you know, get, you were giving away a game with Dylan Covey versus Spencer Strider. Um, I, I think that you're probably looking at a three, a better pitching matchup for yourself there. I'll give them two out of three. And, and you know, I don't like the Mets. And I think it's funny because the Phillies got swept by the Mets. And yet, when you go back and look at that, that entire series, you sit there and go, they should have won every freaking game. <laughs> like, it should have been a sweep the other way. They were just so bad themselves. The Phillies, the Phillies shot themselves in the foot in all three games against the Mets. So I'm giving them two out of three against the Mets. Okay. Um, and then, you know, then you go to Chicago, which another house of horrors for them of late or team just in general that they don't do well against. Um, so I, where did I, so I had that, what, uh, three, four, five. I had them losing two out of three to the Cubs in Chicago uh, and then win the last game of the month against the Nationals. Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, I'm mostly with you. I actually look at this series and, and I know I cannot be in any position to predict the Phillies to sweep a team, but I know you did it with the A's. I, I look at this Tigers team and I'm sorry. Like you look at the probable pitching matchups here and it, it kind of comes back to this bigger, bigger picture for me, which is if you want to be this team that makes the playoffs, you want to sell the the idea that this is legitimate, this this operation, that this is going to be a, a thing again where they can overcome the slow start. And I see that you have Nola, Walker, Wheeler lined up versus Wentz, TBD, and TBD, and you're at home, and you've been so bad. And if the, the word urgency is a real thing, and you know how underwhelming you've been, and now you're coming home, and you're feeling okay about yourselves, like, from just a, you know how we talk about in the NFL week to week, situations, spots. You might not like one team as much as another, but you say, man, this is a great spot for this team. That's why I'm going with them this week. Well, not only are the Phillies a better team, but also situationally, like, this aligns for them. And if if there was a situation to sweep a team, this would be it. Like you, So there's part of me that's like, come on, man, like you got to go do it now. And I can break down all three of these, these pitchers for the Phillies and say, like, Aaron Nola. I mean, how many times have you heard me say it on this show? We talk about the underwhelming start against Atlanta, the underwhelming start against the Mets. You're at home against the Detroit Tigers. If you're that guy, like, really, like, really. And I know, I know that this is 
this might be hyperbole. Like, this might be an exaggeration by me. But, like, if you're really this guy, this $200 million guy, like, go out and be that guy tonight, please. Because you weren't in the last two big spots. So, could you at least do me a favor and show up one out of the three and hammer down a win tonight? So, there you go. That's one. Hey, Tywan Walker, you, you weren't feeling good the other day? You, your body wasn't ready for the day game? You could only go four innings against your former team? It was a disgraceful effort. Show me you got a little something this week. Come back home, throw one of your little six-inning, one-run games. Show me the one that kind of gives us hope about you again. And then Zach Wheeler. like I, Zach Wheeler's been one of the best pitchers in Major League Baseball for the last, what, three, four years? Since he's been in Philadelphia, he's been one of the game's best pitchers. He didn't have a great start the other night. He wasn't helped by his outfield defense, that's for damn sure. But he wasn't great the other night. A start after he was great. Anytime Zach Wheeler takes the ball at Citizens Bank Park, as good as he is, I'm taking the Phillies to win. So, like, to me, I know you can't predict the sweep. You know, those guys are good, too. They get paid, too. But this is time for me to, like, cut down this deficit if I'm the Phillies, get it from 5-under to 2-under, and then go show that you can play with one of baseball's best teams in the Dodgers after you got your ass kicked by them last month or two months ago, whenever that fell on the calendar. I guess it was the beginning of May. So... You know, I, I, I want to see the Phillies go 5-1 and one this week. They better not go any worse than 4-2. and two. Like, you got them at 3-3. Three and three. That, would, to me, would be – that would be no good. <laughs> I, I, would, I would be – if we're sitting here next Monday talking about, oh, there you go, the up-and-down Phillies, 3-3. Three and three. Come on, man. Look, I hear you. Um, I, I don't know. I just, just – the, Do- the way the Dodgers are going right now. Yeah, they're really good. All the more reason to sweep the Tigers. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's I mean that's why I look at it and say, I, look, I agree with you. I, I agree with you that this is this does line up for them. But Detroit has been, you know, they they are a little bit better than you kind of thought they were going to be this year, right? I mean, th- this is a team that you know they've done some good things. Um, I just have a hard time sitting there saying, yeah, it's going to be a definite sweep, right? I mean, I, I don't know. You're probably going to get Reese Olsen in one of these games who was a kid that they just called up. He had a nice start against the White Sox over the weekend. Um, so who knows? I mean, yeah, Phillies never do good against kids who just come up out of the minors. For some reason, they look they look off. They can't, you know, they can't figure them out. Um but man, like the Tigers, even though they're under 500, I mean, they've got a better record than the Phillies, and they're in the race in the Central Division. They got they got something to play for. Uh, I I don't I have a hard time sitting there saying it's going to be a sweep. I mean, I, I don't know. I just I just think it's a I just think it's a thing where something's not going to go right. To be fair to the Phillies, they are percentage points. They're both five games under, but the Phillies are percentage points ahead of the Tigers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the Phillies um, have that going for them. Because on Friday night, they were arguably the worst team in the National League. So the, the one, the one thing I will say is, uh, the Tigers' best player, at least in my mind, just went on the he went on the DL is Riley Green. Um, so their lineup is probably leaving a little bit to be desired at this point. I know mckinstry has been really good for them since he got there. Uh, they put him in the leadoff spot, um, and he's getting on base a ton. Um, but the rest of the, they got guys on that on that team who are just dogs. Again, this is this is, and I mean dogs, not with the A W, but the the traditional right. spelling of dogs. Um, like Javier Baez, what the hell happened to that guy? Right. right. That, I mean, he's just terrible. Um, they, Jonathan Scope, I mean, who used to be, you know, a nice power guy. I mean, for a second baseman, you know, now he's 30 years old or however old he is and he can't hit worth a lick. Um, Torkelson has not developed like they kind of thought he would as the number one overall pick in the draft. Uh, uh, you know, Cabrera is playing as the DH, but he's, he's not even a shell of himself. He's a, He's a shadow of a shell. I mean, that's how that's yeah, how, that's nothing more than a farewell tour. In fact, I, you get yeah. to a point where if Detroit was able to hang in there in a race and he continues to play as he is, do you get to the middle of August and say, mm, We know you're a legend, but I, uh, you know, we got to scale this back? Yeah, oh, I think you do. I think you could, I think you make him a bench guy at that point. 
Like if you're still in the if you're Detroit and you're still in the race, I think I don't think you I don't think you get rid of him because I think that's a bad vibe. But he has to become your 26th guy on the on the on the team. Right at that point, a guy you trot up there to you know pinch hit every game and hope he hope he comes through with something. But yeah, so that's the thing. I mean, I get you know they have won a little bit with smoke and mirrors, and it's not a great lineup. So yeah, maybe they get the sweep, Bob. Maybe you can convince. Maybe you convince it, huh? me. Maybe you talk right. me into it. Maybe you talk me into it. Glad I was able to do that. I mean, then the second half of that question is: you get to the end of the month, and if if they aren't five hundred, is is it okay if they're? And I don't know how the math works out. So, but if they're two games under, three games under, is that a, no? A point where you start to slam the alarm and say they can't do it, they won't do it, or you, it, yeah, go ahead. No, I mean I, I don't slam the because again. And, and, and I, I've been discussing this with some people who are big baseball people. The, the way that the National League is is set is trending this year. That that's wild card spot, man. It, you, you're going to get in at 84, right? I mean, like, so even if you're two games under 500 at the end of June, you're in it. Like, I mean, that that's you're not going to fall out of it. You're going to be in the race for that wild card spot. And if you're the Phillies and the or a team like the Padres, you know teams that have committed a lot of money and a lot of energy to being a playoff team, you're not just going to suddenly say, "Screw it, we're not," you know, "we're not contending at this point." We're they're going to go, they're going to push, they're going to make moves to try and get in. So if you're two games under, three games under at the end of June, you're not out of it by any stretch of the imagination, and they are going to keep pushing for it. And part of me is like, that's great. That's awesome. That's really what you should be doing. I, I, I'm not someone who believes in, you know, oh, I'll, you know, let's just give up on the season at some point. Like, no. What would it have to be? What would it have to be in July to to consider taking this thing apart? Because that's a conversation I've had with with some people that, um, I would say <laughs> to use your phrase, are big baseball people. They've said, you know, I, I don't know that it would be the worst thing in the world if this team had to strip some parts. Uh, when it got to the end of July, I mean, are we at what eight under 10 under? I mean, because I agree with you that the National League, you can probably qualify for the postseason with 84 or 85 wins. And I don't think it's impossible to be under 500 at the end of this month and do that. But if you get to the end of July and you're left with 63, 64 games, and let's say you're eight under, you know, at that point, because also not only is it just simple math, but imagine what this looks like from now until the end of next month if this team is playing under 500 from where they're already at right now i mean what are we saying about this team for that to happen we'd have to be like well trey turner's hitting 210 which <laughs> i guess is possible at this point kyle yeah. schwarzer didn't have june happen this this game that he had yesterday was just a fluke uh jt Romuto this weekend was just a fluke bounce back bryce harper I don't know what like, there's just so many different things for it to get that bad. I can't even, I can't even tell you what that would have to look like. But then again, if you would have said, well, 27 and 32, what would have had to happen? I don't know that back in the middle of March, I could have constructed that scenario for you either. So. Yeah. So here's my response to that. And, and this is, I'm going to, I'm going to harken back to something from the world of hockey here, but um you know, talk to Chris Terry and my podcast partner on Snow the Goalie sometimes um, about what what goes into a bad season for a team. And he says, look, he says, sometimes when you're a, an athlete or a team, he says, shit happens in a season. For whatever reason, you have a you just have a bad year. But you really you still know that your group is a good group and is a team that should compete a team that should be winning he says you give sometimes you give that year the year and just chalk it up at the end and say well that sucked but you know coming back the next year you're going to be fine it's he says when you get to that second year and it's still the same thing that's when you say okay now changes need to be made so i think the phillies are probably in a situation with this team and with the guys that they have under contract for how long they're under contract, um, to say, 
yeah, let's let's not push that panic button. The only name that you could even consider, I would think, if you're in a situation where you feel like you're out of it at the end of July, is Nola because he's a free agent at the end of the season. That would be the only that would be the only one that you could sit there and say, okay, maybe you can break it up from that. What, what if I come talking about a guy like? Else. I have three names here because I think you can give the year of the year because I think in a lot of ways, the Phillies are totally constricted in what they can do. I mean, these contracts are, you know, they're, they prohibit that type of maneuver. I think in most cases, yeah. Soto Kimbrell, like if I come calling about either of those two guys, are you, I think, especially Kimbrell. Kimbrell probably, I guess maybe he could. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah, because you're probably. Well, I don't think that there's any like scenario here where you you take the the handles and you detonate. You know, I don't. Yeah, think no, I mean, like, like that. There, there, yeah, there's not going to be any big names. Like I, I, said, I can certainly see cool. because I mean, come on, how is this going to play out? And I, I, there's so many other things we can talk about that the future of Aaron Nola right now probably isn't it the what I expected to be talking about here. But if you're the Phillies, you're sitting here saying, okay, well, we. We didn't like him at his best enough to sign him to the money that he wanted. Like, let's just be real. I don't know if they were being cordial. If, you know, they all said the right things. It was, well, we think Aaron's great and we want to revisit this. And Aaron wants to stay here. But they weren't even close. So Aaron Nola at his best, the Phillies said, no thanks at that price. So has anything happened in the last two months that's changed that dynamic? Other than maybe Aaron Nola saying, oh, shit, I can't command that type of money. Maybe the Phillies will bank on me on on me bouncing back because they know me and I'll come down and be more reasonable and now we'll meet in the middle. Like, does it feel to you like Aaron Noll is going to be here in 2024 and beyond at this point? Because to me, it does not unless he totally blows up his own market. At which point do the Phillies really want to take a, another flyer on an early thirties pitcher who's trending towards mediocrity? Hi, so here's, Walker. so here's, here's what I say with Nola. If for the rest of the season, he pitches to his baseball card in the sense that same because his whip right now is pretty much identical to what he what it is in his career the problem is is he's not striking out as many guys and so there's more contact being made against him and when you get more contact it automatically leads to a higher era right um but if he gets back to throwing some more strikeouts and puts up the numbers that he's used to being pu- putting up I think he will come down from his demand, and I think the Phillies will still look to re-sign him. <laughs> but if Aaron Noel continues to pitch as he's pitched for much of this season, then I do think that the Phillies walk away at the end of the year, regardless of what the team's situation is. I mean, he's going to be part. You know, you're in. You make the playoffs and make a run. And Aaron Noel's going to be part of it, and I still think they would walk away um, unless he suddenly became, you know, playoff hero, right? Um, but it, you know, if but if he does get back to doing what his numbers have done year in year out, then yeah, I still think that they would consider bringing him back at a reasonable price, and he might have to come down from that two hundred million number. But I mean, that's what I, I mean. That's where I think it is. But it's it's all it's all on Nola at this point to do that. I mean, it's not. There's nothing that makes me think, you know, that he's going to, you know, it, that the Phillies are suddenly going to say, oh yeah, man, this is a guy we need to give, we need to overspend on him going forward. Right. I, I, and you know what, Bob, when you say that we look at the numbers, when we talk about the, the dollar figures and yet, you know, maybe he wants 200 million and the Phillies probably are less than that. It could also be a term thing, right? I mean, when you look at a guy who throws as many innings as he throws, um, maybe they look at it and say, it's going to break down at some point. Like, you can't. You just can't throw 200 innings, 200 innings, 200 innings, 200 innings anymore with any success. With the, you know, for so for so long. So maybe they want it to be a shorter term deal, and maybe he didn't want that. Maybe he wanted something that would be longer term. So maybe they're not so far apart on the dollars. Who knows, right? I mean, we don't we don't know what the the reasoning is. But yeah, it's on it's on the pitcher at this point. It's he's got to he's got to be better, or else he's not the Phillies could walk away and he's not going to get what he thinks he deserves. Uh, I'm with you on that. And, and listen, just go back to the original point about how do you approach the trade deadline? Where do they need to be? 
One, I do not expect them to be eight under, 10 under. I don't expect this team to sell. I'd be stunned. I think as long as they hover around 500 and they're at the end of July, they will probably make a move or two. Maybe they may not go all in. They might not go for broke. They might not part with multiple top prospects to make a push for a, a team that's just simply 500. But I, I think it's more likely that they are going to buy than they will sell. And I think I, the reason why I asked the question is because my expectation is by the end of this month that they are right at 500. And I assume that in July that they will make a move beyond it. That, that's my assumption. And it, we, we come on here and we've been negative. We've trended negative. We always kind of just call it like it is. I don't think that we're pom-poms guys by any stretch of the imagination. You go back to the history of our show. This team's been hot and we're always the guys that are like, yeah, but I think we're pretty realistic about what we're watching here. But as bad as this has been, I just don't know. Maybe I'm intoxicated by what I saw last year. And so am over, I'm, I'm so willing to just overlook what this team has been by and large up until June of last year. And they've been totally mediocre, right? So I'm willing to admit maybe I just can't get beyond what I saw late last season, but I just think that there's more than this. And that's why I've kept saying all along, as bad as it's been, probably still a playoff team. That's still where I'm at today. Yeah, and here's, here's the other thing that – you know, we don't really talk about, haven't really talked about this because, you know, you don't really talk about playoffs early in the season, right? And, you know, even in June, it's still way, way, way too early to talk about these things. But be, let's be honest, Bob. If, if you're the Phillies and, and you're looking at what's ahead of you, the task ahead of you to try and get, get right and get back and get into the playoffs, do you not look at the National League Central and say, that that number six spot in the, the is is gold. It's gold because that's where you want to be. That's the team you want to play in the first round. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can't win the division, you don't want to be the four five. You don't want to you don't want to play that that game. You want to play the whoever wins the ugly ass central. Because yeah, you, you don't want to be in the spot the last ten days of the season if you know you're going to get in. It's like quiet tanking. You know. Just, yes. Let's middle yeah. this thing. I mean, in all in all honesty, and yet, you know, you know, you end up playing who you play. You don't, you know, you let it you let it play out, and guys will never really, you know, tell you that they're doing it one way or another. But it's got to be you know, if we're looking at it, and they look at, they they got to be doing the same thing. They got to be sitting there saying, yeah, like we'll take we'll take Milwaukee in the three game series right now, Pittsburgh, whoever the hell wins that division. Like it doesn't matter. We'll take that team in the first, and get the momentum going again, like we did against the Cardinals last year. I mean, mm -hmm. that's fine. And then let, let whoever else gets in beat the hell out of each other in the other series. And then all of a sudden, you're, you know, are you playing the Braves in the second round again? Okay, maybe. But guess what? You saw what happened last year when that happened. So, so like, that's all it really takes. So, yeah, if you're, if you're close enough, they're going to make a push no matter what their record is. It's just if they're close enough to that six, they're going to push. It still uh, frustrates the hell out of me that we're talking about the Phillies' best, best path forward as being the sixth seed, like, as opposed to <laughs> – Winning the division. Well, or... Bob, I said it last year. If we remember, we go back and look. I don't remember. I what episode yeah, winning it was, the division but... might not be advantageous in the playoffs. And uh, uh... the baseball adding that sixth wild card, baseball damaged the division, the division setup, because it, winning the division does now does you no favors. Okay, well, can we just get it back to 2010 and 2011, where the Phillies just blow through the regular season, and and then we have. <laughs> Bone crushing, soul crushing disappointment in the postseason because they they don't do what they're supposed to do. I'd rather yeah, be that. You know, I'd rather spend. I'd rather have a hundred and sixty two game march where I'm just giving everybody the finger about <laughs> about how. I mean, especially that was especially the case in 2011, um, where you just feel like, oh my god, this team is so good. Uh, yeah. As opposed to, well, you know, it's okay that they're five games under, fifty nine games in, and if they can just get that six seed, and you, know, you watch and wait and see, because they'll go to Milwaukee and beat them, and then they, uh, it just, I don't know, it's kind of lame. You're right, like I can, I can admit you're right about what you're saying, but I also hate it. Oh, I, I don't like it. I don't like it a little bit, right? But I mean, you know, let's, we're just, if we're being honest with ourselves about it. You can look at that and say, at some point, when you determine that chasing down the Braves and trying to win a division is not going to happen, and we're not at that point yet, right? I mean, but so, but at some point in the summer, you look at it and say, okay, well, we're not going to catch them. So, what's our target? Right. 
The target's six. Sure. There's no, I totally there's I totally no question the target's six. <laughs> that's it. So that's all. All right. So a couple other things I wanted to hit on before we wrap this up today. Um, just three players uh, very quickly. We talked a lot about the leadoff spot. The Phillies don't have a great solution. The solution over the weekend was to put Kyle Schwarber back at the top of the order. That got a lot of people, uh, I don't know, fired up, a lot of rolling eyes. You saw what he did this weekend, got on base a little bit, a couple home runs yesterday, six runs batted in. I don't want to ask you about June Schwarber. I have no idea if that's real or not. We'll see. It, it kind of does look real. But <laughs> – is, is he now the solution moving forward back in the leadoff spot? Is Are we back to this for good now? And I've said this before. First of all, caveat, I don't think Kyle Schwarber is a leadoff hitter, period. Yes. Period. Like, I would never lead off a guy who does what he does. I don't care that he walks a lot. If you hit if you hit home runs, you need to be in the middle of the order. You dri- you're just going to drive in more runs that way. So I would never do that. That being said, so you say this the day after he knocks in six at the top of the order. Yeah, I know. Well, it's because it's because guys got on base at the bottom of the order, right? Which is not always the always the case. Um, that being said, if I've, I've we've said this year, if he gets going, and that's your best option, then fine, you put him there because yeah. it worked last year, right? It worked. In, in and of itself, I mean, it was it was the right guy to have in a leadoff spot last year. I still think there are guys who should be better options for it on this roster, but they may not be right now. And if that's the case, then, yeah, fine. You put Kyle Schwarber there. Huh. All right. I think we actually – I want to up our, our production level on this show and start getting segment recordings. Like, it's <laughs> the Trey Turner update. Like, dun, dun, dun. like we got to talk about Trey Turner. Trey Tur- so there's all this feel good stuff this morning, you know, feel good, uh, relatively speaking to what it looked like at the end of last week. And uh, you look at what Trey Turner did this past weekend, which uh, was nothing. And he finished the road trip at six for 42. He's down to a season worse now, 232 batting average. Do you, do you have anything new on Trey Turner? And if you don't, you can just say no and we can move on. But there's no way you can do a Phillies podcast and not just a- acknowledge this sinkhole in the middle of the lineup at this point. So, uh- one of the things that I was going to bring it up when we were talking about the whole Ellis, Sosa, Harrison situation. Do they possibly give Turner another day today and play Sosa at short? <clears throat> Save him from the, the boo birds, let the team see if they win. Now all of a sudden you got three in a row. You're engendering good feelings about the team again. Is it possible? Maybe. Maybe. But – if you ask him, is he going to want to do that? Probably not. Of course not. Seems to, Rob Thompson seems to defer to his premium players. Um, I, I don't know. And, and the answer to that is possibly. I, I guess I'd still be surprised because I think that, that they and Rob probably look at it like, all right, we're home now. Bad road trip. Last time you were at home, though, you were the hero. Uh, and let's see if we can kind of bottle some of that. And let's see if we can get you going against a lefty who's not, as we said now for the fourth time, not particularly good. So I could see arguments both for and against that. Uh, I guess the, the other part of the equation is as another 10 games of this goes by. And so now that's, that's where we're at. We're 10 games past the home run against Arizona where, Hey, look, this could be the swing that gets him going. And clearly it did not. Are we, trending to a scenario in which this is just an absolute lost season for him and that we will stop saying things like, well, conventional wisdom in the back of the baseball card and his track record certainly indicate that he is much better than this and will be moving forward. Or or can we just say, you know what? He stinks. And this year is going to be a total, total bomb. I mean, you, you could start thinking it for sure. I will never put it past a player of that, of his caliber to at some point figure it out. So could, could it be possible that it's, it's just, it's the Nick Castellanos 2022 year for Trey Turner. It could be, it could well be, 
but at the same time, I'm not, I'm not going to just say he'll never, he'll, he'll never figure this out until next spring. Like, I, I just can't do that. You're, you can't go from being one of the top 20 players, 25 players in the sport, and just be in after two bad months, determine that the next four are going to be bad, too. Would it be you know fair to say that, Would it be fair to say that he stinks right now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. See, I'm gonna and, I think that, ahead. and I think that, and I think we sometimes get caught up in semantics with wording. And, and I think that the fact that you said right now mm-hmm. is important because he does stink right now. He has stunk for two months. There's not anything about his game in, the, in these two months where you go, oh, okay, well, he's he's been okay at this or he's bad defense. Bad, bad at the plate, bad decision making, bad everything. But does Trey Turner stink as a baseball player? No. So, so that's why when you qualify it and say right sure. now, thousand percent, you can say it. I can't, but I can't sit there and tell you he's going to continue to stink for the next four months. Let me ask you a question that has been posed to me several times, and I've struggled to answer it. Why does he stink right now? What is know. the thing that is making him play so poorly? I, Bob, it's, it's, it's not, I don't think it's anything that's tangible. In because with sense. Nick, we learned after the fact that it was, well, New City wasn't very comfortable, the family dynamic, he, you know, missed his son. Like there were things, he missed the birth of, you know, all those stuff, all, all that stuff. And you go, okay, like that's, that's real human stuff. Yeah, and who knows? So Turner, Turner, unlike Castellanos, is not as open mm-hmm. uh, about his about himself in that way. I mean, yeah, he joked that his mom was booing him, right? But that's that's the extent that you're going to get from Trey Turner about you know life away from baseball uh, and family. Uh, so it's possible. It's certainly possible that there is something in his non-baseball life that is in I hope him. not. I mean, I hope for his sake, it's just that he can't figure out the spin of a ball right now. Uh, you yeah. know, I don't, and I'm not suggesting or insinuate by very, very, to be very clear, not suggesting that anything outside a locker room is having any impact on him whatsoever. But I, I just look at this and it's just, it's crazy because you're not talking about a one month stretch. You're not talking about a two week stretch. Talking about 60 games now where he's played at a level that we've never really seen him play at before. And he's he's had stretches throughout his career, somewhat prolonged at times, too, where he's not what you see on the back of the baseball card. But it just has reached a point of absurdity now where you're like, well, I don't blame any fan for saying, Jesus, like, is, is this ever going to get back to where it, it ought to be? And I think that most people, even the ones that are very frustrated and impatient, would say, ah, I guess, reasonably speaking, you would expect them to get there again. But in the short term, is it fair to wonder if you're going to get 240 hitting, mediocre defense, 18 stolen base, 14 home run Trey Turner this season? Like, is that a, now a possibility? Like, I don't think it's absurd to, to wonder if that might be the case. Uh, I still personally just, I can't believe it. So I would say no, but I think it's fair to wonder. So here's the thing, Bob, and you you can probably uh, address this even better than I can, but this is, this is just observations of an old, of an old guy. And and you could probably talk about it from, you know, the coaching perspective and on field perspective. If the rest of this team is hitting and he's and he's not right, like a game like yesterday, for example, where a bunch of guys were going, even though he wasn't. Um, if that becomes something that's a little bit more consistent, does he become a more consistent player? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, does, does it become infectious in a way that when the lineup is hitting, there's a little bit less pressure than that maybe he puts on himself? Whereas when the lineup is not hitting, as it has been for a while before this Nationals series, um, then the added pressure is there to, to perform because of who he is. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, that didn't, it didn't work that way for Nick Castellanos last season, but I, two I, different, I think they're two different kinds of players. Two different guys, two different yeah. kind of players, and I would agree that 
you know, Trey Turner probably has to go home at night and, and be disappointed in himself and his own struggles, but then also knows that his struggles are directly correlated to the team's failings and the team's underwhelming play. So when those two things go hand in hand, it's like, well, what's wrong with the Phillies offense? It's Trey Turner. He has, he has to feel the weight of that, you know, double in a sense. So yeah, sure. If the Phillies start to hit and they start to win games and everyone starts to feel good about the team and he doesn't feel like he's letting the entire city down and it's not what's wrong with the Phillies. This team sucks. Oh, by the way, Trey Turner's item one a, every time we have to talk about it. Sure. Could he probably relax a little bit? I I would think so. And you know, when I think the most logical point that you land on when you say, well, what's different with Trey here is that he's in a new city. There's massive expectations. He probably thinks that this is the team that he's going to go into the Hall of Fame with if he just does what he's done the first six, seven years of his career, just continues to play like that. This guy's going to go down as a legend. He, he probably does feel the weight of the situation, the expectations, not only for himself, but for the team. So, sure, the Phillies start playing better baseball. They move him down in the lineup. It's not all on him. Maybe that gets him going where he can then be that guy again. And that was one of the reasons that I was very adamant that they move him out of the top of the order. Not only did I say it was insane to hit him in front of Bryce Harper, but also just to maybe give him a different look and a different feel. It may not be the one he wants. Maybe he wants to hit at the top of the order. But I think anything that you can do to change his overall feel – and slot in this team right now, you have to do it. Yeah, and and it's a good point when you when you look at it, Bob. I mean, here's here's a kid who was uh, drafted by the Padres, so you're talking about you know low key environment in San Diego. Gets traded to Washington, which there's what's the fan base in Washington? It's a transient fan base down in D.C. Okay, uh, and then you end up with the Dodgers where you aren't the guy, no matter how good of a player you are, there are so many other players there who are even bigger names than you are. Um, And now you come to Philadelphia with $300 million attached to your name. And really the only name who's bigger than you here is your, is your buddy Bryce Harper. And so you are, you are the number two at this point. And without Harper here to start the season for the first month, he was the number one. He was the guy that was supposed to carry the team, and he didn't. And so maybe when you get into a month long, I'm I'm not you know I'm the guy and I'm not living up to that expectation. You start doing things that screw up your approach and screw up your swing and screw. That's why I'm saying maybe now you know Harper's back and for a month now. Okay, great. Turner's still struggling, but maybe once everybody else is clicking and you don't have to focus on Trey Turner so much, maybe that's when Trey Turner can become Trey Turner. And maybe that's what we're learning about him is he's, he's a Robin, not a Batman. Well, that, that does it for our our most recent what's wrong with Trey Turner segment. Uh, I look forward (laughs) to doing this again on, on Friday with you, but uh, listen, we're, we're kind of getting short on time here. There's one other thing I just want to mention. I didn't know where else to fit it in. But we probably should have saw this coming with JT Romuto. Uh, He goes over on Friday night, uh, a couple bad at bats and big spots for him. Uh, Over the first eight games of that road trip, he was two for 25. What's wrong with JT? Then the last uh, two days, he goes four for nine, hits a pair of homers, uh, breaks a home run drought that had started on April 30th, which I actually think I referenced on Friday's show. And, you know, I say we've seen this before with him because if you go back to last season, you remember Bryce Harper gets hurt out in San Diego. Yep. Uh, and he did that on, I believe, Saturday night, if I'm not mistaken. He did that in the Saturday night game. And the Friday before that, JT Real Muto had gone hitless in the opening game against that Padres team. Uh, and he, at the end of that game, was hitting 265, which is higher than where he's at right now, but his OPS was at 665. And then from there on out, he was awesome. And arguably the Phillies MVP. offensive MVP at the very least. Yeah. Yep. Uh, big reason that they got to where they got last year. And now this year he's hitting 258 with a 752 OPS. So he's almost 90 points ahead of that. Um, he's I got a lot of doubles. We do this like what's wrong with JT thing a lot. Is there nothing wrong with JT? And this is 
he's a good player and he went through a bad month and and so almost exactly what we just said about Trey Turner, but the opposite because he's breaking out of it. And yeah, so here's the thing with Real Muto, and it drives me nuts. Um because his swing is all about timing. Like he is one of those, I mean, now he's got that leg kick and everything else. So everything's timing, timing, timing. When his timing is on, he's a very good hitter. Mm-hmm. When his timing is off, he's shit. And that's what we've just, I mean, seriously, and that's what we we saw for a good, por- a good portion of the month of May is his timing was just way off. Um, so it's, you know, it's just a matter of him being in that right rhythm. Um, he made the adjustment last year and it worked and he took off and went with it. Maybe he made that adjustment. Maybe he figured it out, found something, made that slight adjustment. And when we say timing is off and I say your shit, I mean, it's, it's very subtle. Like it can be something really, really subtle in, in your swing, where you start with your hands, um, you know, where they're, where they're at, uh, how close the bat is to your helmet when you start your swing. Cause you have more of a plane that's got to come through. If there's a million different things, maybe your, your leg kick is a little bit too high or whatever. Like it's time. The tiniest thing can throw off that timing. So whatever it was, maybe they figured it out. Maybe they found out what it was. And now going forward, he's going to be, you know, the good JT again. Um, we'll see. I mean, I, I don't, I don't ride two games and say, all right, that's it. He broke out. He's fine. I need to see it for a little bit more than that. But, I, you know, it's possible. It's certainly possible that he's he's figured it out and he's going to go in the, in the other direction, and that would be good for the Phillies. Very well. Hit me with the one last thing, and let's wrap this up. Well, I had, I had one other thing. I would, before I get to the one last thing, but they, one does lead into the other, so it's good. Two last things. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Nick Castellanos, just one, of the, one thing I wanted to touch on him. Um, he's still got 73 hits. As I know he's among the league leaders in baseball. He's on pace for 200. <laughs> Can he do it, Bob? Can he get to 200? He'd be the first Philly since Jimmy Rollins in 07 to do it. Wow. I know. <laughs> well, uh, one thing and, I'll and say. It, it, it's hard to do in today's game, too, because, you know, guys just aren't hit. Hits, you know, hitters, right, anymore. I mean, Luis Araya is sure. But, I mean, other than that, I mean, guys don't hit like that. Can he get to 200? I'm going to bet no. I mean, can he? I'm I'm not going to tell you he can't, but I'm just going to say no. At his best, his second best here is 185. I just pulled up. He, I give him a lot of credit because we saw him start to cool off. And then this past road trip, he's been on fire again. And you mm-hmm. you had to wonder, okay, he, he got off on a good foot. He was rolling. You feel good about Nick. But you felt like, wow, you know, how much of this is being spurred by the momentum and just I'm going well right now. How long can I ride it? And you were waiting kind of maybe not for the crash, but when things did slow down and they did, you wondered if they would come to a screeching halt. And the fact that he was able to slow down and then pick it back up again to me is so encouraging because now we're not talking about a guy that's just, Oh wow. You know, good for him. He's probably feeling better about himself. It's not going to snowball against him this year, but then what happens when there is some, maybe some doubt creeps in or, uh Oh, like, am I going back to where I was last year? And for him to just be so good right now, uh, I, I think really does bode well about the level of consistency that he might be able to maintain throughout the course of the year. Do I like Nick Castellanos to hit over 290? I do maybe even 300 if I had decent odds on it, but 200 hits is a whole different, whole different ball game. I just don't think he can do that. He would have to maintain this pace for the remainder of the season. Cause right now yeah. he is on pace for exactly 200 hits. Um, so it's not like he's ahead of that pace. So I agree with you. I don't think he, he gets it. I think if he's healthy and plays, you know, all 162 games or whatever, I think he comes up just short. Um, but I do agree with you. I do think he, he could be a 300 hitter. Uh, there is a world. Season. There is a world, though, where he eclipses his hit total from last year, and he did miss time. Uh, he only played 136 games, but he could eclipse his hit total by the end of July uh, yeah. of, of last year. So that that would be uh, that would be interesting, and that would be a welcome welcome development for this team. Okay, yeah. well, here's the here's the one last thing. So story came out. I think it was uh, USA Today um, talking about. Um, uh, the commissioner potentially inviting or giving all-star nods 
to Kenley Jansen and Craig Kimbrell for, you know, reaching the 400 save plateau. And this is something that is uh, the rules allow for the league to do these things, to honor certain players. Um, and uh, that would be, a, you know, that would be nice. You want to honor Craig Kimbrell. That's great. And, you know, I'm not going to say you shouldn't do it. That's, that's awesome. But here's the one last thing, Bob. Does that mean that Craig Kimbrell could be the Phillies' lone all-star representative this year? Well, um, <laughs> go around, uh, go around, right? And tell me of uh, the current Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, who on this team deserves to be an all-star? Just start there. Who would you say is on the short list to even be considered an all-star this season? Nick Castellanos? Is he one? Yeah, as, not as a, I don't think he's a starter, but I think as a reserve, you can you can put Castellanos for sure. It, Rob Thompson's the manager, right? The whole Phillies coaching yeah. staff is there. Yeah, Thompson and the coaches. So I think if you're you have a player that that has a massive bounce back season and he goes into the all-star game hitting 315 with you know a ton of extra base hits, I don't think that's a hard sell. Right. So, to me, he's the most like. Forget the Kimbrel part of it. He's the most likely, I would say. JT Real Muto. Um, he might get voted. Have, yeah, he might get voted just because of reputation. Voted, it would really help. I mean, he's been he's been fine. Yeah. Uh, this weekend really helped. If he can get on a stretch here for the next two three weeks, he he may have a a, a strong case. Other than that, I don't. Uh, the only other guy I thought that. And again, it, it probably has to get doesn't get back till next week. But if he continues for the next month, once just, he gets back, is Alvarado. I agree. He would have been a slam, the slam dunk, but he's missed a long time. And to just be kind of a, I know it's a different game now. We're not talking about a, a closer now and down twenty two saves by by June, but I just don't think I don't think so. Yeah, I don't. But that's it, right? I mean. All that money, all that money, and that's that's the list. And it could just, it might just be Kimbrel. I think I probably asked you at some point in March how you many are for the Phillies. Yeah, and I, I think I, I think we said I think you said the I think you set the over under at two point five. Yeah, and I and I think I remember telling you that that was a great odds because two was likely and three was possible. Um. And now they may not get two. I think I, only time I said Turner, Slam Dunk, Real Muto, and then I said take your pick of Nola Wheeler. I think was yeah. how I got the three. Yeah. 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 For sure. And, and maybe a case for Schwarber too because of the home run volume and, yeah. and all of that. But, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting question. I have no problem with them inviting Jensen and Kimbrell, although I don't think that 30 years from now we're going to look at those players and say, oh, man. You know, you saw you saw Kenley Jensen pitch. I just don't view him that way. But no, I don't either. I just, I, but I think I do think that it's worth recognizing that the way the game has gone now, yeah. that the era of the 400 career save pitcher is probably going away of the dodo bird, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's not going to happen. So this is this is the the end of an era in a lot of ways, and so therefore, you, you know, the last couple guys who get there, you probably want to say, hey, we recognize what your contribution was yeah, in an era where this was important. Um, and so therefore, guys, congratulations. You get an all-star nod. So, but I just think of it, I just think it would be a, an indictment on this team's first half if the only all-star you got was a guy that was invited by the commissioner <laughs> for a lifetime achievement. I, I just especially cannot, with your coaches what happened with that staff in the dugout, but yeah. we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. So oh, anyway, oh, that was man. my one last thing. All right. <laughs> well, for <laughs> Anthony Samplip, I'm Bob Weichel. We'll be back on Friday after the Phillies uh, complete their three game series against the Tigers. And uh, hopefully we're talking about the Phillies coming off a sweep because my God, they need one, man. So, Make sure that you follow us wherever you get your podcast. Check us out on YouTube, uh, and we will talk to you soon.